We're in a small summer series on personal revival, personal renewal. And uh, this morning, what I want to share with you is I want to share with you a thing that we call confession. You know, they tell us that confession is good for the soul. And confession this morning is we're going to look in the book of Romans in chapter 7, so you can go ahead and be turning there. We come across what I would call confessions of a struggling soul. We come across an apostle who lists out what he's going through in life. And what he's going through in life is not unlike anything that you and I go through. As a matter of fact, here's the deal. We all wear our mask, do we not? You know, here we are, we're, we're dressed in our church clothes. I had a friend at the earlier service from the center of the universe in Springfield, Missouri. Um, he said, I wish I were brave enough to preach in a shirt like that. And um, because, you know, probably there they're wearing coat and tie because it's a different culture and such as that. But, um, you know, we, we put on our church clothes, right? Now... When we put on our church clothes, we're, we're given a certain persona about who we are and how we're made and, what, you know, what's on the, what the deal is. But I would uh, propose to you this morning that a lot of times when we put on our church clothes, that those clothes also include a mask. And it's a mask that we want people to think this is the way we are, but we know that when we remove the mask, as it's portrayed there on the front of your bulletin, it's a far different person inside. We all have struggles that we deal with. We all deal with temptation. Uh, many of us uh, deal with strongholds in our life, which I'll talk about here in just a little bit. But there's all kinds of things that are going on. You know, we don't want people to know certain things about us. Like, for example, this morning, I'm having a difficult time seeing what I have written because I left home and forgot to put in my reading contact. Now, why do I wear a reading contact? I don't want you to know that I need glasses, you see? So, you know, we, we all do this to a degree. There's, there's, we all do it to an edge, and, and, and that's one of the things that we deal with. Now, when we come across other followers of Jesus Christ, this is what we have to, to recognize, that we all come together by faith in the accomplished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what we want to do, it doesn't matter, you know, where we're from, many of us from other places in the country, and, and some of us are from churches of different denominations, but it's all the church of Christ, you know, it's just different flavors, that's okay. But here's what we all want to do, we all want to honor God, right? We all want to express our love towards the Lord Jesus Christ, and we want to live out our lives in obedience. And one of the real problems that, that we face then is we want to do the right thing, but so oftentimes the right thing that we want to do is not the very thing that we do. Hello, can you identify with that? Okay, I, I think we're going to hit a chord right here. In our minds, we desire to be willing servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we find ourselves oftentimes enslaved to sin. And so we begin to talk to ourselves in that moment-by-moment -moment struggle, and we say, I want to do the right thing. I know what the right thing is, but inevitably, I blow it. I love God, and I want to keep his commandments. I love the Lord Jesus, and I love the Holy Spirit. And the greatest desire of my heart is to be obedient to God, but I too often times fail in my life. And can I tell you the truth about this? Every person who has ever followed the Lord Jesus Christ has been plagued by the very same thing. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul would write concerning this in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 7, he talks about the law of God being a spiritual thing. It's here to direct us and to help us. And by the time we get to verse number 21, he says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right... He said, evil lies close at hand. You ever notice that? Make that fresh commitment, God, I'm going to do what's right, and evil's right there close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? You know, where's our hope? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. 
Now, remember this about the Apostle Paul. He's probably one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. He was beaten for the gospel. He was shipwrecked for the gospel. He was imprisoned for the gospel. He stood before kings and potentates, and, and he was fearless in the proclamation of the gospel. And he, uh, and, he, and he underwent unbelievable persecution for the gospel. He wrote half the New Testament, it seems, as you read through the letters. And here we find in Romans chapter 7, the very confession of his heart, the confession of a struggling soul. And the confession of that struggling soul identifies some truths, and a truth means that it's true for all things, some truths that apply to you and to me. Because what about us today? What about the life that we live today? You know, are you struggling? And if you're not struggling right now, have you just come through a struggle? And perhaps you have got a struggle waiting in front of you. We don't know what tomorrow holds. However, when the struggles come, we want to do the right thing. And as we read this confession and study it and understand it, we not only understand that that Paul um, uh, had these struggles and we understand him better, but it helps us understand ourselves. And the very first truth that he lays out is this is that we are slaves to sin. We're a slave to sin. Paul was a slave to sin. I'm a slave to sin. You're a slave to sin. He says right here in this chapter, in the 14th verse, he says, for we know that the law is spiritual. We know the law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, and I'm sold under sin. He lays out three things right there that are truths. He says, first of all, the law of God is a spiritual thing. The law of God is a standard to help us live a life that's holy and to help us live a life that is righteous. But a second truth, he says, but I'm a man of the flesh. And you're a person of the flesh. He confesses his carnality. He confesses his flesh, that struggle with the human nature, which is not done away with, by the way, at the day of your conversion. When you accept Jesus Christ, you're not going to live a perfect life for the rest of your life. As a matter of fact, you may not live a perfect life for the rest of the day. You're going to mess up. You're struggling with that old fleshly nature. In other words, he's flesh and bones, and as long as he lives, he'll be flesh and bones, and he'll have that fleshly body, and he'll have to deal with that fleshly nature. So number one, the law is spiritual. Number two, that that we are people of the flesh. And number three, he says, I'm sold under sin. You know what that means? It means without the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, he ha- he's out of control. Without the help of God, he was a captive and he was enslaved to sin. And that man of flesh, you see, has desires. And, and the fleshly desires are wrapped up in our five senses. Now, our five senses are great, are they not? But, you know, we've got the sense of the smell. We have the sense of taste. We have the, the sense of seeing. We have the sense of, uh, of smelling and the sense of feel. And, and, and those are so important to us. You know, we, we hear as the choir sings and we're moved through their voices. I didn't tell the choir group this time, but last Sunday, y'all did awesome. You did awesome this Sunday, but last Sunday, it was just kind of like over the top. I don't, you know, it was awesome. I, I, I appreciate that so much. But, you know, we're we're moved by that. We feel the music. You know, when you go to lunch in a little while, you'll taste the food. You know, we we want to satisfy those desires. And the entirety of our lives are are lived based upon the gratifying of our sight and our taste and our smell and our hearing and our feeling. And all the fleshly man wants to do is live to satisfy those sensual, uh, fleshly desires. You know, yesterday I'd eaten pretty clean all day. You know, I, I had a hamburger without the bun and, and all that kind of stuff, grilled out on the grill. And I came in from the church last night and I said, man, I wish we had some chocolate almond ice cream. And, and uh, my wife said, well, there's some butter pecan in there. I said, I didn't see it. And she said, well, you can't see it for looking for it. And, and so I went back, and on top shelf, sure enough, there it was, slow churn butter pecan ice cream. And you know, that, that so appealed to my, to my flesh. It was cold, and I was hot. It was tasty. I could sense, I could feel the nuts. You know, I like the crunch of the nut, you know, in, in ice cream. And then after I ate it, I said, why did I do that? You know, 9 o'clock at night, last thing I need. 
And isn't that the way it is anytime we mess up, anytime we fail, anytime we fall down? We say, why did I do that? Why did I get caught up on that? Well, we fail and we get caught up in life because we are slaves to sin. And any person without the Lord Jesus Christ is a slave to sin and they're living only as a sensual being. And when you observe the bad behavior of people out there, you know, bad people on, you know, uh, whatever channel it is, doing crazy things, the top 20 worst, and all that kind of stuff, you say, what kind of an idiot would be that way? Well, that's what you once were without Jesus Christ, and that's what people are without Jesus Christ. They are not in control. They are being led and guided and directed by their senses. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote, wrote to the Corinthians, and he said, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. In other words, they're silly. And he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discovered or discerned. And, and here's the deal. You know, for, for lost people sold under sin, never having Christ in their life, for us to come in here this morning, this is pure silliness. This is a waste of time. It's not profiting anybody any kind of deal. And, and, and people who are lost, you know, what they have is they've got a natural man. But that natural man, that fleshly man, is not just a little pipsqueak that lives inside. He's not just a little devil on, on one shoulder whispering, do this and do that. He is a ginormous, natural, fleshly monster. Now, I typed in ginormous when I was doing my notes, and, and Word kicked it out and said, this is not a word, right? I went to the dictionary, and I proved Word wrong. Because ginormous is a word. It means extraordinarily large. And, and, and what happens if we don't have Christ, we've got this extraordinarily large, supersized, ginormous, human fleshly nature that is pushing us and is crying out continuously, feed me, feed me. I want some butter pecan ice cream. That's what it does. As a matter of fact, the Corinthians, to whom Paul wrote, you know, there were people, man, they were so narcissistic and hedonistic. They just lived for themselves. They lived for pleasure. They said, man, pleasure's made for me and I'm made for pleasure. He wrote to the, to the Corinthians and, and he said, you know, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for the food. That's what they say. God will destroy both one and the other. The body's not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. You know, here's where they were living. Their flesh was saying, man... You know, sleep with as many as you can sleep with. Have sex with as many as you can have sex with. Have relationships with as many as you can have relationships with because you, you know, you've got this desire. Satisfy that flesh. And Paul's saying, you know, it's not the flesh that we live for. We live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what happens when you satisfy that flesh and you seek to feed that flesh, you end up bringing destruction upon yourself. You end up bringing destruction upon your family. You end up bringing destruction on those who are around you. You end up bringing destruction on those that you may not even know. And I don't believe that anybody starts off to feed that flesh so as to bring destruction on everybody else. They know. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, their minds, their heart, they're darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from a life of God because of the ignorance is in them due to the very hardness of their hearts. Their hearts are blind. You know, they are one-dimensional people. They're living only for the moment. They're living only for the flesh. They're slave to sin. And Paul said it, he said, without God, I'm hopeless. And remember that's what you were before you got saved. Remember, you were just out there living. You were selling it away. You were living those pleasures. Those pleasures were made for you, and you were made for the pleasure. You were a party animal. Right? Remember? And Christ came along, and he saved you. He paid the price. He paid the price to take you out of the slavery of sin. To give you a spiritual life and a spiritual hope. And that's where everybody is, remember? Romans says there's none righteous, no, not one. For all sin and come short of the glory of God. David, the, the king of Israel, the man after God's heart said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. 
So Paul was sharing a truth without Christ, we are enslaved to sin. The second truth that he shares is this, wanting to do good does not equate to doing good. Just because you want to do it doesn't mean you're doing it. In chapter Romans 7, 15, he says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Hello? You know, I can identify with that. Why did I do that? The very thing that I hate, why did I do it? You know, we're torn between uh, the, the carnal, the fleshly, and the spiritual nature. We're torn between two worlds, this world and heaven. And many times Paul wanted to escape the predicament. And he said, Lord, just, just take me on. But God chose not to do that. We can all identify with that. Think about this. Here we are in church attendance. We got up this morning and we prepared ourselves. We drank our coffee. We maybe read the word, we uh, addressed our, our looks, our clothing, all those kinds of things, and, and we came to the house of the Lord. We got excited as the worship ministry brought forth songs of praise that moved us and moved us towards heaven. And we took out our Bibles and we follow along seriously as the word is exegeted. But there continues to be a habit in our lives, a bad habit. And Paul refers to that bad habit that continues to be there as a stronghold. And every week we commit that very same sin over and over and over. And every Sunday we're convicted about it and we pray and say, God, I know my sin and I promise I won't commit that sin this week. And we go out the door and Monday comes and Tuesday comes and by the time Wednesday comes, that old stronghold in that flesh is crying out, feed me. I want it now. If you'll just do it this once, you'll be satisfied. Just this one time. But as we all know, just drinking physical water, we've got to have more of that all the time, do we not? And before we get to the next Sunday, it's grabbed a hold of us again. And back at church, we walk in defeated and we wonder why we should even try to follow the Lord Jesus. And we finally admit, I can't do it. We don't want to sin. We don't want to bring reproach on the Lord Jesus. We don't want to bring reproach on his church. So why do we do it? Why do we fail? Why do we fall? Because we're attempting to do it in our own strength. And that ginormous natural man monster, that ginormous natural man monster is bigger than our strength. So the third truth that we recognize here is there's a battle. There is a battle between two natures going on inside of you as a believer, inside your heart. When you came to Jesus Christ, something miraculous happened to you. You were born again. Your sins were uh, forgiven and you were brought into the family of God. You were given a new heart, a new nature within you. So, so here is this old carnal, ginormous, natural man nature that, that you've been accustomed to all of your life, that's gotten its way all of your life, and suddenly you've got this new nature born within you. The book of Ezekiel says, I will place in him a new heart. Listen, this is what happens. In sin, you're dead. The book of Thessalonians says that, that we're made up of, of, a, of a spirit, of a soul, and of a body. Now, when we sin, our, we're dead immediately, spiritually, before we know Jesus Christ. We're dead spirits, right? And it's just that ginormous natural man ruling and reigning over us. We've got a soul. That's our thinking ability. And uh, so our spirit was dead immediately. Our thinking ability dies out progressively. And our body that we see, touch, taste, smell, hear with will die ultimately. But when Jesus Christ becomes the Lord and Savior of our life, our spirit is made alive immediately. Our thinking's made alive progressively, and our body will be made alive ultimately in heaven's glory. Now get a hold of this. Suddenly you're born again, and the spirit of the living God inhabits your spirit and has brought life into you. You're now a spiritual person. But that old ginormous natural man is still kicking. You know, a while back I killed a snake. You know, if you live in the south, you're going to kill a snake from time to time. I just took the shovel and off with its head. I came back around that point in the yard a little while later. That thing's still wiggling. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the Bible says that he crushed the head of the serpent. 
But let me tell you, that serpent still wiggles. When the Spirit of God came to inhabit your spirit and live in your spirit, he crushed the head of the serpent of the natural man. But that natural man still wiggles, still wiggles. Because when you get saved, you know, that's great. But you've still got to deal with two natures. You've got a battle going on inside. And God has placed within us his Holy Spirit. He's made us spiritually alive. But the remnant of old John Normus is still there. You know, as those who've been born again, then with these two natures present, you know, we have a new heart that wants to do the righteous thing, that wants to do the right thing. The new man loves God and tries in every way to be pleasing to the Lord. But on the other side, that fleshly carnal nature living for the senses and the result is there and the war is going on. And, and Galatians 5 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. And, and, and here, you know, the, the flesh whispers. Come on, just give in. Just give in this one time. Just give in this one time. And the, and the, the natural, uh, and the, the spirit urges, no, stand and resist. In the Old Testament, there's a couple of guys that stand out as perfect examples of this. One's name was Joseph. Joseph, you know, he, he got picked on by his brothers. And his brothers sold him off into slavery to go down to Egypt. I mean, who needs brothers like that, right? But uh, God puts his hand in it, and God's in control. But Joseph finds himself as a servant in the house of a, of a powerful Egyptian man by the name of Potiphar. And Potiphar had a, had a wife that, that looked at Joseph and said, Man, that's one, hit, that's one hunk of a young man. He's cut. He's ripped. He's got jaw lines. He's got beautiful eyes. He doesn't even have a unibrow. I want him. I want to have sex with him. Now, Joseph, he's just like us, guys. Everybody has the same desires, right? And he had to do something. That flesh is saying, man, you can give in this one time, old, old potty. He'll never, he'll never know about it. You know, nobody's going to ever know. Go ahead and give in. But the spiritual man in Joseph said, run, Joseph, run. And Joseph ran. He still suffered accusation. He, he still suffered scourge, but he ran. While later we come across a man named David. You know, he authored the Psalms. David's out on his rooftop. You know, it's kind of hard to imagine if you've never been in that kind of a culture. You'll see that if you go to North Africa with us. All the roofs are flat and people are on top of the roof all the time, whether they're bathing or drying, uh, you know, um, apricots or, or uh, almonds or whatever else. And you look across, you can see what other people are doing. And, and this day he looked across and, man, he saw one beautiful girl. Her name was Bathsheba. He said, man, She's glorious. She's glorious. I've got to have her. And he took her. And he had relationships with her. A child would even be born out of that. And to begin to cover it up, he sent her husband to the front line of battle knowing that he'd be killed. And yet the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. His flesh was saying, come on, David, you can do it. You're the king. A king can have anybody he wants. You're the king of Israel. David, you can do it. Nobody will ever really know. Well, he found out that people were getting to know, so, you know, he had to launch off into the second thing. And now it's been known for a couple of thousand years what David did. But yet he's called a man after God's own heart. And that, what that shows me, that shows me that you know, we as followers of Jesus Christ, we, we can all love the Lord. Joseph loved God. David loved God, no doubt about it. But there comes a place in our lives where we've got to have a determination that exists that I'm going to be sold out completely, fully, wholeheartedly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in moments like that, I'm still going to slip, fall, and fail. And I've got to understand that when I slip, fall, and fail... I've got to come back to God. David would come, later come back to God, and he says, you know, that God would rescue him from that pit. And he did. He was rescued from the pit. And so that brings me 
to this. That we need a Savior. I mean, it's hopeless without Jesus, is it not? Think about this. It's hopeless without Christ. We need a Savior. Romans 7, 24 says, wretched man that I am. You ever feel like that? I want to have victory. I want to do what's right. I want to succeed. I, I want to live for the Lord. I want to, I want to, I want to. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Recognizing that these things trip us up, cause us to fail and to fall and ultimately die. Who will recognize, who will, you know, do, who, will, who will rescue me? How can I ever find victory over that old sinful nature? It's only through Jesus Christ. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. But with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. In the message translation, which I really count more as a commentary because it takes a lot of license, but I like the way it wrote it out here. It said the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in his life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something that is totally different. And what Paul had happen in his life is God would deliver him. God will do the very same thing in your life and in my life. So... Christ, number one, will take away our guilt. Don't you think that Paul had guilt in his life? And he, in his life, is a picture of being forgiven. In Acts 9, it said that Saul, this is before he got saved, that he was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Think about this. When he met Jesus Christ, he was carrying on himself all this guilt. He had killed people simply for following Jesus Christ as Savior. Isn't that amazing? He held the coats of the men who had stoned Stephen, the first martyr of the church, for his faith in Christ Jesus. He supervised the persecution of Christians. He had memories. And he thought of those that he was responsible for their death. He had a load of guilt. But when he met the Lord Jesus Christ, there was an awesome and eternal change that took place. And all the pain and all the guilt got lifted. And you and I can identify with that. You and I can identify with when we accepted Christ Jesus, there was a peace that surpassed understanding that guarded our hearts and our minds. There was a joy that overflowed in our lives. We were set free and, and we had freedom indeed. I believe Paul could have identified with Isaac Watts when he wrote the words to the, the song at the cross. He said, was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my, my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. All the history of our lives, all the burdens we bear, all the guilt that we have, everything boils down to one point in history, and it's the cross. So oftentimes in our world today, Particularly here in North America, we judge a church by all the toys that it has. Its sound systems and its viewing systems and its band and its music, if it's hip enough. How hip, you know, the, the pastor's dress and all these different kinds of things. And certainly we're guilty of some of those things, you know. I mean, we've got the most comfortable seats of any church. I mean, many of us grew up on the hard benches, pews. Remember? And then they began to get padded pews. Ooh. And now we've got theater seats. I imagine our next step's going to be reclining theater seats. <laughs> right? Oh, we, we must be honoring God. 
But in the midst of all of our fi- fi- uh, fineries, I want to remind you that it all boils back down to something that wasn't so fine. It was at the cross. It was at the cross my Savior died. It was at the cross he groaned for my sin. It was at the cross that his blood was poured forth. It was on the cross that he covered all the guilt of my life. And he showed us his victory when he not only died on the cross and went to the grave, but he showed us the power of his victory when on the third day he was not in that tomb, but he had risen as he said. And that same Jesus who rose and that same Jesus who 40 days later went back to heaven is the same Jesus that will one day come and call us to glory with him. But in the meantime, he wants us to know that he can set us free from the guilt. The second truth here is that he informs us. Jesus Christ is the light of the world and he's the light of our hearts, the light of our soul. And when we follow after him, he helps us understand what's going on inside of us. You know, the problem with believers who fall into sin is they fail to understand what's going on inside of their hearts. They hear a sermon that sin is wrong because every time they do it, they get in trouble and they live under guilt and fear, always looking over their shoulder. They confess, I don't want to sin. I I find myself yielding to the temptation, to the lust, to the jealousy, to the envy, to the gossip. I don't understand what's happening inside of me. I don't want to do it. And you see, you've got to come to understand the nature of what's going on, the battle that's going on. There's a battle of the flesh and the battle of the spirit going on. And those two natures are battling it out and the spiritual man and the carnal man. And can I tell you this right now, that the greater of those two is going to win. Now, how do is determine the greater of those two? Because the scripture tells us greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. If your spiritual man's going to be greater, you've got to feed that spiritual man. If, you're, if your carnal man's going to be greater you've got to feed that carnal man in order for me to be strong as a spiritual man I've got to feed the spirit what do I feed the spirit well I don't feed the the spirit the things of the flesh what I feed the spirit is as I feed the spirit the word of God I feed the spirit conversation with God what we call prayer I feed the spirit fellowship with God's people Uh, that's hanging out you know uh, you know like the other day when it was raining so much I think it was Wednesday or something and traffic was just like awful. Remember? Yeah, yeah, but I remember I was coming in from South Walton. It took me two hours to get from there to the church office. And um, Matt asked me if I had lunch plans, and I didn't. You know what we decided to do? We went and ate at Cracker Barrel. You know, Cracker Barrel. Good old Cracker Barrel. You know why? Because it meant that we didn't have to get on the highway. We'd get through the parking lots and get there. Right? So we're feeding ourselves. Well, if I'm going to feed myself spiritually, then I need fellowship. And sometimes it's around the table, like we had. So I I need Bible. I need conversation with God. I need fellowship with other people, right? I need to have those times of corporate worship where I come together with the body of Christ. Like how many of y'all are not even from Destin? Wow, that's awesome. But you know what? You're in the body of Christ, are you not? The Lord is with his people. And we come together. And we come from different parts of the country and different parts of the world. But we are his bride. We're here together to bring him worship. I need that. And I need that individual worship. And as I do that, what I find is Christ makes me powerful by his Holy Spirit. And that's the key to the victorious life in Jesus. I admit that I can't, number one. Number two, I tell God I do the things that I don't want to do. Number three, I admit that I'm powerless and hopeless. And I say, Holy Spirit, reign in me. Reign in me. Fill me, move me, guide me, direct me, empower me. Paul said to the Galatians, but I say, walk by the Spirit. Listen to this. And you will not gratify the desires of that ginormous natural man. To the Corinthians, he said, and to you, he said, there's been no temptation that's overtaken you, but such as is common to man. 
You think your, your, your temptation's unique? Remember the theological word I have for things like that? Baloney. Your temptation is not unique. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, he tells us. But will with the temptation also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. There's a way out. There's a way out. And God is offering you that way out. In 1 John we read, little children, you're from God and have overcome him, them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And here's a simple answer to the complex question of my confession. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. How simple can it be? But if you're like me, you're not going to come to Jesus right away. You're going to say, I won't bother God. God's got plenty of others to be concerned with right now. I'll take care of it myself. And you know what will happen next week? You'll be in the same boat that you're in this week. But to come to Jesus. When you come and give it to him, he'll take the burden. He'll lift the load. He'll remove the guilt. He'll provide forgiveness. He'll give you a new heart if you've never been saved. And he'll strengthen your heart if you walk with him. Come to Jesus. We're going to sing a song in a second. Based on the Psalms, it says, As a deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul longs after you. I'm going to give you the opportunity as a follower of Jesus Christ. We want to have victory, right? You know, we've talked about in our elders' meetings, one of the greatest needs of the church is that of a real revival. I'm going to give you opportunity to come to this altar, to come to Jesus, and symbolically lay the burden down that you're carrying. Symbolically give Jesus the stronghold that's got you. Give him your marriage. Give him your children. Give him your future. Give him your future mate. Give him your struggle. I'm going to give you that opportunity. For some of you, you need to be set free. You need to say, Lord, I need you in my life, and I want to follow you. You can pray that prayer any way you see fit, and I encourage you to come and say, Pastor, I want to receive Christ, and let our counselors give you the things that you need, the tools that you need to take the next steps. But I just want to come to Jesus. It's just that simple. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of truth and grace. Lord, to that Jesus we come this morning, submitting our lives, our temptations, our strongholds, the issues that we deal with. Lord, saying, I want revival. Lord, let it begin in me. We come to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. You come right now as we begin. Come and fill this altar. Come to Jesus. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long 
to worship Thee. You're my friend and You are my brother even though You are the King. I love You more than any other, so much more than anything. Alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. This morning, I just ask you to bow with me in prayer as we join the prayers of those at the altar. And I invite you, if you feel so lifted, uh, so moved, lift up holy hands unto the Lord. It's just a symbol in the Bible of complete and total surrender to Jesus. Saying, God, I surrender. You know, you don't have to be a Pentecostal to do that. He calls you to be a follower in his army. Father God, we bow before you, and you've heard the cries on this altar this morning. And I lay these cries before you, not, Lord, because I'm some special pastor, for I'm not. But I lay them before you because I've got a special Savior, Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I I lay the prayer for healing in your people. I lay the prayer for forgiveness. I lay the prayer of confession. I lay all these prayers before your throne in the sweet and precious name of Christ Jesus. And, Father, I ask you to bring victory. Lord, I ask you to bring strength. I ask you to bring endurance. I ask you to bring your power from on high and anoint us like we've never been anointed before. Oh God, to you be the glory, both now and forever, in your church and in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you this day. God pour his spirit out upon your life this day. You go in peace. You go in his strength. And when you fall and when you fail, remember he still loves you. And he's got an awesome and a magnificent plan for your life. Kaleo, bless y'all till we see you next year. God bless. You're dismissed.